Welcome back, everyone. I certainly hope that you had the opportunity to stretch those muscles. Maybe you had lunch, or if you're on the other side of the world, perhaps you are just having your dinner. Thank you so very much for joining us and for staying with us on day two of the seventh regional platform for disaster risk reduction in the Americas and the Caribbean. So earlier we had our concurrent sessions, and now we're getting down to two special sessions. Our special session uh, is, is extremely important when we consider the fact that Jamaica is the first Caribbean country, English speaking also, to host a regional platform. And so this special session is about the Caribbean. Uh, the title is A Regional Approach to Coordination on Multi-Hazards, 2020 Lessons from the Caribbean. The organizers are the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, CIDEMA, the Government of Jamaica, Office of Disaster Preparedness and Emergency Management, OPDEM, Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, ECLAC, the Pan American Health Organization, or PAHO, the United Nations Program for Development, UNDP, and our esteemed moderator for this special session is Horace Glaze, Acting Deputy Director General, Office of Disaster Preparedness and Emergency Management of Jamaica. We also have the Learning Lab, and that is a closed session. If you happen to register before, then you would have received a link in your inbox. Certainly go ahead, check to ensure that you have the link and click on the link. The title of that Learning Lab 2 is Forensic Investigations of Disasters, or FORIN, F-O-R-I-N. The organizers are the Social Studies Network for Disaster Prevention in Latin America and the Caribbean, La Red the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, and the moderator, Alonso Brenes, coordinator of the Social Studies Network for Disaster Prevention in Latin America and the Caribbean, La Red, and Zelmira May, or me, responsible for disaster risk management, UNESCO, Montevideo. Please enjoy. Good afternoon, Buenas tardes, Buena Pierde, Media. Welcome, delegates, ladies and gentlemen of RP21. Uh, we have a very interesting special session two for you, the regional approach to coordination and multiple hazards, 2020 lessons from the Caribbean. Certainly, we will also be you know, touching on a little of what transpired, given where we are in 2021, and also hearing a perspective also from the Americans, um, but our focus being the 2020 lessons within the Caribbean. Thank you all for joining this very special session. I'm sure you will find it very interesting and, you know, have a lot to take away. The, we have a very esteemed powerful women of the Caribbean panel. Uh, firstly, let me introduce our main presenter, uh, Miss Elizabeth Riley, the chief uh, executive director, or the executive director from the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency as our main speaker. Then we have our panelists, our first panelist is Miss Michelle Forbes, director National Emergency Management Organization of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Then we have Ms. Cynthia Fischamp, Associate Administrator of the Office of Policy and Program Analysis, the Federal Emergency Management Agency in the United States of America. We also have Dr. Joy St. John, Executive Director, Caribbean Public Health Agency, CARFA. And of course, we also have Ms. Claudia Herrera, Director, the Coordination Center for the Prevention of Disasters in the Central America and the Dominican Republic, Ciperdinac. Thank you all again, um, participants. And we will move straight to our first speaker, Ms. Elizabeth Riley. 
Thank you very much, moderator, and good afternoon to you and to my fellow panelists. And thank you to all participants for joining this special session. We're very honored to have you. So in my presentation this afternoon, I want to start by setting a bit of a context and to track a little bit what happened in 2020. And of course, the first thing we have to talk about is the 2020 Atlantic hurricane season. As you know, this was a record-breaking season where we had 30 named storms, 14 of which became hurricanes and seven were major hurricanes. Now, this of course is a reflection of what we will come to expect as we uh, endure more of our changing climate in our region. But I also want to talk a little bit about the multi-hazard context, which is why we are here. So the hurricane season, that very active hurricane season took place against the backdrop of COVID-19. We had our first cases in March of 2020. But in addition to that, we saw activity in a number of other areas and a number of other hazards. So towards the end of the year, we moved into the effusive eruption of the Las Dufer volcano in St. Vincent. And in October of 2020, we also had a, a situation where the FSO Navarima, a floating vessel which uh, stores oil, um, posed a measure of threat just in the Gulf of Paria off of Trinidad and Tobago. So I think what this really signals is the type of complexity that we're seeing in our events, certainly in the Caribbean region, where we have hazards happening both concurrently as well as cascading. So what about the lessons? Let's talk about a little bit about that. So I think one of the first lessons is how we can make good use of our existing mechanisms. How can we effectively leverage them? And in our region, we have what is called the Regional Response Mechanism, or the RRM. And this is our regional arrangement for how we provide support to states that have been impacted by hazards. And you will note on the diagram, it looks a little complicated, but not really. Um, essentially, we have our governance arrangements, which holds everything together through our plans and our memorandum of understanding. Um, we have at the center of everything, a regional coordination center, which I will speak about a little bit more in the next slide in terms of how we adapted during the year. And on the right-hand side, we talk about our surge support or the deployment teams which are provided to the states. And towards the bottom, you will notice we have what are called our sub-regional focal points, which are Barbados, Trinidad, Antigua, and Barbuda, and Jamaica. And they perform a very special function within our system to make sure that geographically we are able to respond quite quickly. So I think the critical message here was really about agility and flexibility. And we recognize that we definitely could use our existing mechanisms, but we should not be afraid to pivot and to find new ways in which that mechanism could become more effective. And one of the ways that we found was in adjusting our governance arrangements, particularly as it relates to, related to our regional coordination center. And specifically as it related to COVID-19, we established a new cell within our regional coordination center. And this is our core coordination group on health. One of the members is here with us today um, in the Dr. St. John, who's the executive director of CARFA. And this was a very critical mechanism allowing us to have a very close coordinating relationship with the health sector as we traverse the COVID-19 pandemic. And this arrangement is still working. We also, recognize the importance of partnerships. This was a loud message from 2020. And working closely with our regional and our international partners, very importantly, towards common results. And once we had agreed to the direction that we wanted to go and what we were trying to achieve, the coalescing around the, those common results became much easier. And in fact, this mechanism, the core group, it, it functions up to today. And we also have support from the institutions of the 
security cluster who worked alongside us. And you will see, for example, that the regional security system and CARICOM impacts are integrated into that partnership diagram. I think the season also taught us how to maximize opportunities because as challenging as COVID-19 was, we found that there were spaces where we could try new things and to explore areas that we had not fully explored before. And one of those areas was in the area of logistics. And recognizing the challenge that the region was having in accessing personal protective equipment and also in keeping with the efforts of our political leadership to identify and leverage PPEs for our, for our Caribbean states. We set up an integrated regional logistics hub in Barbados, located at the Bridgetown port for marine items which were coming in via marine transport, and also at the Grant Yadams International Airport for those which came in by air. And we were able to work together with private sector partners, including regional airlines, our military colleagues, including the French installation in Martinique, to ensure that these personal protective equipment items, as they came into Barbados, they were pushed back out very quickly to all of our CARICOM states, full members and associate members. And this was quite a successful exercise. The other key message, I think, is that it's really about the people. And what we recognize is that the unique nature of a pandemic and the protracted duration that the pandemic has um, continued on and it's, and it's still going, it, it means that it really caused a radical shift in the socioeconomic profiles of our Caribbean states. And this put additional pressure on our social protection systems and I think it taught us quite a lot about the real importance of factoring in human behavior. And the different perception of risk is something that very much came to the fore. And we continue to see it today, even with respect to the extent of which persons are accepting vaccines or hesitant about vaccines. And I'm sure you'll hear more about that on the health side from Dr. St. John. So I want to conclude by just raising the point of resilience, because we have, as an agency, have been promoting resilience as a critical goal of our region since 2001. And in going through the 2020 season with the diversity of the hazards that we have faced, the new challenges that we have faced, the need to really adjust, be agile, be flexible, it really points us back to the central and foundational message that the work that we do, it must be focused on building resilience. And in doing so, there are a number of critical parameters that we have to treat with as we build that resilience, where we are looking at maximizing economic opportunities, where we are discussing operational readiness and recovery, environmental sustainability, social protection, for the marginal and the most vulnerable, as well as safeguarding our infrastructure, because that is where we see a lot of losses happening in the region. So I hope this sets a good context for you. And I very much look forward to the contributions from the members of the panel as we look at the aspects related to the national and other regional aspects of the 2020 season. Thank you very much. Gracias, Senorita Riley. Thank you very much for setting the context so nicely for this session. Uh, some strong statements coming out there. Record-breaking 2020 hurricane season. Strong regional mechanism to be further strengthened through lessons and experiences. Partnerships for effective coordination. People vulnerability and the perception of risk. Thank you. Uh, we move now to our first panelist, uh, Ms. Michelle Forbes, Director, National Emergency Management Organization of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Good afternoon, everyone. Pleasure to be here and um, welcome all to this session. So I'm going to discuss um, this afternoon the whole issue of the lessons learned here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines from the 
various events that we would have had um, 2020 rolling into 2021. So what do we start with? We started with COVID in, in um, March 2020 thereabout. We know it was around. We had our first case then in 2020. Then we had dengue. And I'm doing this. So we had a so we said, okay, it's a double whammy. We have dengue. And in the case of the dengue, um, in 2020 period, we had 1,595 cases and of dengue reported in that period. And, and two. And then it continued again into 2021, where we had two deaths and we had several seven deaths in 2020. We saw some cases declining in 2021, but by then we call that a double whammy. Then we were graced with the presence of the increasing activities of the volcano in um, December 2020, 2020. And then of course we had the eruption on April the 9th, 2021, followed by flooding in April again, 2021. And then we had, of course, Hurricane Elsa passing through. So the, what, do, what do you combine when you have all of these multi-hazards? You have double whammy, triple whammy, what do you say about four and five? So we have these continue, continuing events um, as we continue from 2020 into 21. And this is the context in which we are, are presenting our whole multi-hazard um, national response and the whole regional response also has to be able to tailor to suit um, this reality. Set in the context, in terms of the national mechanism that was used to manage these various events, we started out with using our national framework and many persons wondered why NEMO was involved in the whole COVID-19 pandemic and, and supporting the Ministry of Health. We don't take over, we support the Ministry of Health and, and coordinate. We were a member of the task force that was established um, December into January 2020. And on March the 14th, we became fully activated at the National Emergency Operations Center level, where, where we actually um, operated for quite some time until the week before the volcano um, showed signs of, of um, going into a more explosive phase. And then we, we continue that whole, whole co um, collaboration because we're one of the few organizations, a few countries in the region that actually utilize the entire national me mechanism to support the Ministry of Health. We had the Ministry of Health who would have started their pandemic plans um, through regional organizations working in the region, TAF and PAHO. And they really they had at least a, a semblance of a, of a plan going forward because we would have gone through Ebola a few years ago preparing for that eventuality if it came here. So there was some already some semblance of plans there for the Ministry of Health and our nation to really look at managing these events. We, at the national system, we had already approached, um, basically adopted the comprehensive disaster management approach to all hazards approach. Many persons don't see it. So that's why the question why we were involved in, in the, um, supporting the Ministry of Health. But those of us who were involved, you know, we had St. Kitts and Jamaica, two of the other countries that would have utilized their national laws and mechanism to support the Ministry of Health. In St. Vincent, we would have established a contingency fund a few years ago that we have, have been contributing towards. And ironically, even though persons thought it was established to mainly deal with the natural hazards, it was this, which was a COVID-19 pandemic that forced us to really um, withdrew, withdrew or take funds from that um, um, kitty to really support the, the resource mobilization at the national level for the Ministry of Health. What can we look at the lessons learned from these events, uh, 2020 into 2021? We need to pay a bit of more emphasis on the resource mobilization. I recall clearly in 2016 there about when we had a partnership with the Ministry of Health and we had a, had a donor, um, we, a donor externally international and in the Ministry of Health, as we were dealing with Ebola then, they saw it fit to, to mobilize the first isolation tent that we had here in St. Vincent. And you see that in the, in the top picture. What can we learn again in terms of, we need to plan for the long haul. 
we start, COVID started well, some of December 2019, early 2020, we're still in it and we don't know how long we are going to be in it. We don't know when we'll have, have the variants to the end power, but we have to continue to manage in this context that it's not a hydromet event that may only um, pass through a few days and we, we, we deal with it. some persons think they're only going to an emergency shelter for two or three nights and then we are now in, in case of the volcanic eruption, you stay six months and we still have 100 plus persons in the, in the emergency um, shelters. So we'd have to look at these multiple scenarios, contexts, and how we are going to manage at the, at the national level, at the community level, because persons can be displaced for quite some time. We have uh, the COVID-19 pandemic in particular has really placed a socioeconomic strain on our country. Many persons who have been displaced by the flood, displaced by the volcano, how, how are they surviving? Because many have lost their jobs, those who were sailing on the, on the cruise ships, et cetera, and now it places another um, strain on the country and economy. We saw the economy declining by 3.5% in 2020 from the um, um, COVID pandemic and doubled with the volcanic eruption, we're looking at 6.5% thereabout. So we need to focus a lot of these things in terms of how um, looking at our remote resource mobilization because we recognize that COVID had already stretched our, stretched our basically disrupted our, our um, supply chain. We couldn't get cuts in preparing for the volcanic emergency. We were looking for supplies um, for the health sector and it was difficult for us to really um, to, to manage in some, in some cases. We have to follow the science. I don't want to debate the science on the, on the COVID-19, but we have to follow the science, especially in terms of the volcanic eruption. Many thought it would stay um, effusive for a while while the scientist was preparing us for that event. We knew it was going to go bang at some point because we, we didn't have a contract with the volcano to say, hey, um, come tomorrow, or come next week, or come next year. It came when it was supposed to come. In lessons learned, we look at, look at the data management tools, our logistic support systems. When we started out, for example, with the um, COVID, that was one of our challenge, and we saw it manifesting itself again in the, in the volcano um, emergency. We didn't have those kind of tools to capture the information, capture passengers coming in as we'd like, issuing them with um, passes or, or exemptions coming into the country to be able to, to, um, to really track to see what was happening with these, with these um, families. Um, so that is one of the challenges, that, some of the challenges that we have. Let's look at the regional coordination now um, aspect of it. I think my time is almost out. I really want to applaud the regional organizations that supported um, this event, uh, these events in the region, like SCARFA, the regional response mechanism through CDEMA, and the RSS, who would have supported the Ministry of Health in particular, and us later with the scientists being able to, to bring the scientists to St. Vincent, taking the samples to to um, Trinidad, and we have to out out this regional response mechanism that we, we have had. This is just a snapshot of things that have happened over the last, uh, last few months, 2020 into 2021, recognizing that we need to also see the opportunities in, in our partnerships with our military organizations, the scientific community, and find alternative routes and means to get into communities. Because after help Hurricane Elsa in um, July 1st, 2021, we had to get into the community by vote. Right, the way forward as I wrap up, we need to really look at strengthening both our national and regional systems, strengthening strengthen our national disaster risk reduction plans to, to talk about displacement, talk about pandemics, public health plans. I've never seen in my life one sector that would have actually created so many um, changes in their, in their laws um, over this period of time because they had to make amendments to the old public health laws and also to, to um, basically formulate protocols, procedures, to really manage this whole pandemic in the region. And I don't think St. Vincent and Grenadines was an exception. We have to update our legal framework to support it. And we have to also focus on the ICT platform that can go across all hazards, all sectors. The coordination of relief at the national and regional level, um, that needs a lot of work to be, going in, to be done in terms of going forward. I think COVID saved us here in St. Vincent to some extent, because then we were not able to have the influx of agencies into the country as may, ha may have happened if we did not have um, COVID around. So that created some restriction. And as I wrap up, I really want us to focus on the sectoral resilience that we need to strengthen in, the, in terms of our intersectoral cooperation um, and coordination at the national level and at the regional level. Our sectors need to be strong. The Ministry of Health sector needs to be strengthened. Many other sectors need to be strengthened so we can actually support this entire national mechanism. And um, here ends my presentation. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Ms. Forbes. Um, there you have it. We see double and triple one is complex disaster response, you know, migration, mobilization challenges, etc. Thank you for that interesting uh, experience of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We move on now to our second panelist, uh, Ms. Cynthia Pishak from the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Thank you, Mr. Glaze. It's an honor to be here amongst this impressive set of panelists. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the Federal Emergency Management Agencies, or FEMA, its role in the COVID-19 pandemic response and other catastrophic disasters over the past year and a half or so. As you know, from 2020 forward, the global emergency management community faced historic challenges as we adapted to performing our critical missions in the coronavirus or COVID-19 pandemic environment. It seems that each year we ask more and more of our emergency managers at all levels to meet the needs of the public doing a variety of compounding events. Um, Michelle spoke a bit about this and the type of role around our all hazards approach. During the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, as Liz highlighted, 2020 brought us a record-breaking season of hurricanes. Um, and in addition, the United States government was responding to wildfires, flooding, and several other natural disasters. While we effectively responded to each of these events, the COVID-19 environment made the response and recovery efforts much more challenging. FEMA and partners at all levels of government developed plans to adapt response and recovery operations to ensure prioritization for life safety, life sustainment, and the protection of the workforce, and continue to deliver on the FEMA programs. Uh, these plans are based on key emergency management principles, which focus on pushing decision making to the lowest level possible. The United States emergency management system is most effective when it's locally executed, state managed, and federally supported. FEMA utilizes 10 regions across the country to coordinate requirements with state governments, local, tribal, and territories. Coordination bodies participate in these daily resource adjudication processes at all levels of government. The allocation of personnel and equipment must be made on a sequence of use rather than on urgency. For example, we don't need to send vaccines to a place where no one is available to administer them. FEMA issued response planning guidance to state, local, tribal, and territorial partners at the start of the 2020 hurricane season with a specific focus on how we could adapt to the COVID-19 environment. For example, the guidance focused on how FEMA would support remote disaster operations given the complexities of the pandemic and the need to minimize the number of response personnel and survivors at risk. This guidance also encouraged local jurisdictions to review their response planning to ensure they could continue to meet existing command control responsibilities while also being prepared for any future requirements brought on by evolving and emergent incidents throughout the year. If you're interested, this guidance is also available to the public on FEMA.gov and it's titled the COVID-19 Pandemic Operational Guidance. FEMA is committed to expanding climate planning and resilience activities that take into consideration all communities, including those that have been underserved. We know that disasters with compounding events disproportionately impact communities that have been underserved, meaning those with a particular characteristic that have been denied an opportunity to participate fully in aspects of civic life. Equity and climate adaptation are priorities for our administration, and we have a lot of opportunity to make strides as leaders in this space. Earlier this year, we stood up steering groups that were focused on climate and equity so that we continue to identify opportunities and barriers for improving our delivery in this space. FEMA is considering these experiences and lessons learned from these unprecedented challenges over the past few years as it's developing its next five-year strategic plan. There are many dimensions of disaster risk reduction and each of you have unique challenges and resources within your own countries. In our experience, successful disaster risk reduction efforts are those that originate at the local level where those initiatives and long-term projects reflect the values and the priorities of those communities. So with that, I'll close with sharing some of our critical approaches to enabling success in this multi-threat or response environment that I hope resonate with you. Um, the first is communicating early and often about the prioritization of personnel and equipment across concurrent events. The second, similar to some of Liz's remarks, are considering employee safety. Uh, people must come first, and it's hard to meet the mission if we're worried about things like our family and how we can keep ourselves safe. And then third, ensuring emergency management, public health, and elected officials 
jointly identify the outcomes to be achieved and associated timelines to help set those expectations. Thank you very much for this opportunity and thank you also to Jamaica and Sedima for organizing and hosting this important event. Mr. Glaze. Thank you very much, Ms. Bishak. Very interesting from the United States of America. You heard it again, local action and education is key. Operational guidelines and tools save lives. Strategic planning for the future. Thank you. We move to our third uh, panelist, Dr. Joy St. John, Executive Director, Caribbean Public Health Agency, CARFA. Hello. Let me see if I can get this clicker. Great. Lovely. So Carf is going to give you a real quick snapshot into some of our work, some of the issues that we have dealt with in the recent months, and how we are trying to strengthen health systems to ensure that countries are resilient. So first of all, I wanted to let you know what are the divisions of labor when we are looking at CARICOM's response to threats, hazards, and events. And if we are dealing with a strictly health-based um, health event like COVID-19 showed itself to be, then usually CARFA will drive that response. But if we are dealing with the usual hazards, threats, and events that happen in the CARICOM region, CARFA becomes part of the SEDEMA response where we will support with a public health perspective. For example, when there was the earthquake, we had a public health response which supported issues of air quality, um, also issues to do with shelters. Next slide, please. Right, so there is a think tank within CARFA called the Incident Management Team for Emergency Response. And this gives you a little idea of how we work. The incident management team is certain to deal with all of the threats that are known to us. And also we are into forecasting. We're into looking to see what will be the outcome of new um, disease issues that we're seeing, or if we are noticing that it's time for the usual disease trend. Next slide, please. So this gives you a little bit about what are some of the multi-country impacts and disaster responses that we've had in recent times. In the past year, we've dealt with floods, we've dealt with volcano, we've dealt with COVID-19, and we have also dealt with an interesting uh, anomaly that, thank God, did not turn into a real uh, event. And this is the issue of the Naparima listing full of oil. And it gives you an idea of the reason why we work so closely with Sedima, because at any moment in time, we can have all sorts of interesting issues. Let's give you an idea of some of the support that we gave to La Soufrière, the volcanic eruption in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So we did things as expected as um, monitoring the disease trends within the shelters to some even more interesting things like doing menus for those in the shelters. And also something we're quite proud of, something we worked with Paho on, and this is EWARS in a box, a system of 
allowing tracking of disease trends and doing this remotely. And here is something um, that we developed. And this was the whole issue of if we wanted to have an evacuation and what were some of the ways in which we could do this safely in COVID times. We also had specific um, evaluations that we were able to conduct during the time. All of this went into strengthening the health systems. So here are some interventions that we have done with vector control. And remember I told you, health-based events, not only has there been COVID-19, but seasonally, we always ensure that we are making the countries well protected and their systems well resourced so there will be no um, great vector-borne disease outbreak. And we've done this all within the ambit of the security cluster of CARICOM. Ms. Riley would have referred to this as well. And this shows you the number of engagements we've had with ministers, with heads of um, customs, immigration, police, prison officers, as the pandemic evolved and we wanted to ensure that there were already far different um, issues. But we also ensured that we had a strengthened tourism sector, the tourism and health program, we are very proud of it, and it came into its own during this COVID-19 time so that we ensured that the, the tourism sector was strengthened even during a pandemic. And we also developed um, awards and an app to allow the tracking of disease. And we cannot forget the whole issue of counterfeit medications. And unfortunately, we've really realized recently that counterfeit medications are coming into the CARICOM space. And here we end up with two things. One, state of public health report, which is a mandate of CARFA, and we did one on climate change. And we had our first virtual uh, research conference this year, and climate change was highlighted as one of the triple threats. Over. Thank you very much, Dr. St. John. Very interesting um, set of experiences from CARFA. Um, we, we hear it again, the, you know, with upwards of three or more hazards um, with a complex response, you know, one is further highlighted. Uh, think tank, a very interesting uh, approach uh, in terms of an incident management team uh, response. Thank you very much, Dr. St. John. We now have our final panelist, uh, Ms. Claudia Herrera, Director, the Coordination Center for the Prevention of Disease, Disasters rather, in the Central America and Dominican Republic, Ciperdina. Muy buenas tardes. Es un placer para el Centro de Coordinación para la Prevención de los Desastres. It's a pleasure for our center for us to have the chance to just really share the lessons learned, specifically in this type of scenarios that are so different in 2020, and that also led us to an unprecedented situation, which has also been quite difficult for our region, specifically to all of us in the Dominican Republic. A lot of natural disasters affected our country. So we can talk about ETA and OTA um, disasters as well. This also led to a series of flooding and to earthquakes and to a lot of threats because after all of this COVID pandemic, which made everything a little bit more complicated in terms of this response and risk scenario. We had material impact as well that is caused by other e events and that yet persist in this region, specifically in this third wave of the pandemic that is now somehow, well, hitting us 
we need to consider that the hurricane, the pandemic, and other local matters not only affected the livelihood of people, but also the human resources, technical, financial resources, in the risk management system. Specifically, when we need to respond to all of these emergencies ever since 2020, of course, we have had a bigger challenge, at least, or most uh, mostly considering what we had expected, because everything becomes worse with the pandemic. So we need to work and to continue really getting work done and orchestrated these storms, these hurricanes also entail significant losses and damages for most of our countries. In the cases of ETA and OTA in November 2020 in Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, we had losses and damages and additional costs in about 2,200 in Honduras, 700 million for Guatemala, and 2.7 for Honduras and Nicaragua, and 742 million. And in El Salvador, and also Amanda and Cristobal also entailed losses in an amount of 2 million, concentrated mainly in the private sectors. All countries, even those of us who were not directly hit or impacted on by these storms, they saw their financial activities hit as well because their supply chains were not as smooth as possible. According to IMO in November 2020, we had that over 1 million persons need to be displaced in different countries, specifically in Central America, because of the impact of this hurricanes, ERA and IOTA, and some other flooding, earthquake situations. And this also led to the displacement of our population in a less visible way. We had, let's say, uh, the sea level rising up as well. And this also led people to migrating the impact of disasters on the Central American countries as well just to continue developing and all of that in 2020 also helped us. And also as part of what we're doing, this also hit the COVID-19 pandemic. And the consequence was that a lot of disasters were hit and for a short period of time and also in terms of recovery and financing. So the financial impact and all of that somehow goes beyond these direct losses that affect our whole financial activity and all of this risk and all over, I mean, mainly all of the different scenarios that we needed to consider. I would like to highlight the different efforts that are being fostered and encouraged from our region. We need to have all of this COVID action, specifically at a regional level. We have United Central America against coronavirus actions which was a set of joint actions to strengthen the national activities facing this pandemic. This also led to just putting all of our efforts together in terms of the climate and also in terms of this coordination platform by means of which we were able to develop effective coordination management with international and national bodies for us to be able to get more information in the analysis on the exposure and vulnerability, moreover, recovery and construction processes after all of this event that impacted on the region, the different risk situation and scenarios that took place and also environmental factors as well in our region in the framework of the Central American policies for risks that are mainly related to the legal realities in our countries have led to efforts to manage risks, development, education, and also climate change, preparedness as a response to emergencies. We have national drills in each and every one of our countries. For instance, in Nicaragua, we have four drills in other countries. They just involve about 1.5 million persons involved that leads to about 6,000 scenarios nationwide. And also the rest of the countries are also developing all of these activities to just find other capacities and recovery. So in 2019, 
we developed the first regional humanitarian assistance drill for us to be able to build our skills, our capacities. And we had 300 members from our rescue teams. They were just really facilitating all of this in all of these entities. And through these drills, we were able to get more practices, more preparedness, more also rescuing actions. And all of this based on the different characteristics of a region, and which main purpose is to provide top quality humanitarian assistance. I would like to highlight that this year, we have found a great opportunity that has been also supported and backed by the different governments at a national region, region at a, at a region level as well, for us to continue just managing different actions to put all of these agreements in place to enforce them and for us to be able to work together in just really addressing the different effects from this pandemic and, well, in addition to the different natural disasters and their consequences. And to do so, we are promoting actions to prioritize a well-being and welfare model based on nature, building more resilience, and also promoting gender equality, social inclusion, access to education, public health care services, food security, the respect of human rights, protection of immigrant population, and also strengthening those institutions that are part of that first baseline response, organized crime, and all of this uh, in a cross-sectorial approach for us to be able to continue as a Central American region towards a sustainable development agenda in the framework of the actions that we have as part of the Central American policies, which are our guiding principles and also the different undertakings assumed by our countries for us to continue just taking all of these efforts and pushing them forward. We need to continue striving for the defense, the effective protection of human rights, governance with particular emphasis on all vulnerable communities, the social financial recovery, and everything that is related to sustainable development post COVID-19 in also developing, fostering science, technology, creativity, innovation, and also promoting, let's say more emphasis on this climate change struggle that we have for us to be able to have this four axis of our Central American policy. One of the key actions has to do with the development of a platform that also contributes to making informed decisions for these tools to just somehow manage information with our authorities, with these risk management systems. And also this allows just taking action specifically on information for the data analysis and also for us to be able to view information in an area where we can classify and analyze and systematize all of these efforts that are taking place and for them to somehow be a benchmark as a mitigation tool at an institutional level as well. This is going to provide regional information. We are also going to monitor and follow up on other events that also are part of, let's say, the atmospheric, biological, environmental aspects up to the design and implementation of digital tools at an operational level as a response and more importantly related to operation for us to be able to provide tools to our countries, tools to just address all of this in a crisis scenario for us to be able to ensure the resilient, safe communities that are capable of operating and also somehow recover facing all of these events. We also developed applications to reconnect data analysis on field to also support national efforts, field data collection devices, specific activities to run all of these activities, control panel to supervise under a regional perspective, this whole COVID situation and a monitoring activity for hydrological and environmental threats. We are also developing and taking efforts through a virtual campus 
and we are just enabling the interpretation and use of the Earth, images that are taken from satellites. We also have scientific communities that are also helping us just strengthen, strengthening all of this. We are in an unprecedented situation, in unprecedented times, and we need to work very closely with our population just by driving actions that can build this culture of prevention, mainly focused on having this comprehensive standpoint in view for us to have a more sustainable, resilient region where all actions are also somehow just focused on our vulnerable population in also and also in the framework of this recovery as part of what we're doing we're just focusing all of our efforts for us to be able to strengthen the different capacities that we have for us to be able to better prepare just facing all of these multi-threats for us to be able to ensure cooperation amongst our countries as well and for us to be able to have better development conditions under this transformational actions for us to be able to guide and drive all of our actions towards that with a better orchestration and cooperation across all of the sectors. And for us to not just manage disasters, but to evidently truly manage this risk across all levels. And that's precisely where we are focusing most of our efforts. Thank you so, so much for just being here with me today. Thank you very much, Ms. Herrera from the Fredinac. A very interesting perspective from the Central Americas. Um, the different dynamics within our cultures, but certainly similar effects on our people, similar vulnerabilities, climate change, multi stakeholder and multi sectoral responses, drills and ex exercises for critical preparedness and response action. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, um, we are now at the end um, of the round of speakers. Uh, we will open the floor for questions and answers. Unfortunately, given the time, um, we will be restricting a question and answer uh, online to only two delegates from the floor. Uh, we will go to those two delegates we have selected. Uh, first up, uh, we will have Rhea Piera from the International Federation of the Red Cross. Please take the floor. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And first of all, thank you so much for allowing us to speak, uh, uh, for me to be a part of this session, and to ask a question to our panel of delegates. So my question to you all this afternoon is this. Red Cross societies serve as auxiliaries to the government. This auxiliary role provides an essential space for dialogue and mutually beneficial relationships between Red Cross national societies and public authorities. As such, a strong auxiliary relationship between a Red Cross society and public authorities can make humanitarian and development action more effective and efficient. As actors within the Caribbean humanitarian space, how can Red Cross national societies best support the work of public agencies in dealing with major challenges of authorities to address the effects and impacts of multiple hazards? Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Spear. Uh, I will pull these questions to two of our delegates. Um, Ms. Riley, I'm going to put you on the spot to get a Caribbean perspective. And then I'm also going to take a country perspective on their response to that question um, from Ms. Forbes. Uh, Ms. Riley. Thank you very much, Mr. Glaze, and thank you to Ms. Pierre for the question. And of course, the International Federation is a very important partner of the SEDEMA coordinating unit and indeed the SEDEMA system. And in terms of how we can strengthen that interface between the IFRC and the regional system, um, I think it is about 
seamless interfacing. Let me just phrase it that way. Because the importance of partners who work within the context of the regional response mechanism um, is that they need to fully integrate into the regional mechanism. And I think we have, as partners, gone quite away with respect to this, where we have spent quite a bit of time um, examining the systems um, which operate and which guide the two institutions, and also to see the best ways in which we can work more closely together while still maintaining the recognition that the, the entities in themselves um, have their own reporting requirements and also obligations um, to their particular partners and their constituencies. Um, just one other point I would want to add, and this is really within the um, context of the, the, the programming and how we are, are working together from a, a programmatic perspective, because I think this work definitely starts ahead of the actual emergencies. Um, it's about how we are able to streamline the opportunities uh, for congruence in the training that we're undertaking um, across the region, and also how we can work collaboratively on the articulation of standards which are of, of, of mutual interest and of mutual benefit to both organizations. And I think um, this is where sometimes the, the challenge, will, challenge will come since we both have interactions at that community level. And so the, the continued efforts, I think, of both of us as institutions to ensure that we bring better alignment um, to those uh, interventions across the region is something that's gonna be very critical. Thank you, Ms. Riley. Uh, Ms. Forbes, your perspective? Okay, thank you. The, the Red Cross is already integrated into the national system here in St. Louis and Belize, and in many of the um, English-speaking Caribbean countries, it's the same. So there isn't to say that they, we need to do, we need to integrate them a bit more because they're part of the national system and they support us throughout all events. And I'll just give you an example. Uh, that I raised on one of the earlier um, panel. We, for example, during the volcanic emergency, we need to get schools back up and running. We need to get persons out of the emergency shelters at the schools. And the Red Cross stepped in as a partner to work with the Ministry of Education and our government in providing mm -hmm. alternative accommodation for those families so that we can get the schools up and running. We partner with them in a lot of other projects, identifying communities. We can support looking at building a community resilience. So we have to continue that strengthening um, with the organizations and um, such as the Red Cross and, and have them at the table with us all the time. I think sometimes we find some we find when there are projects and programs, maybe we don't know about it when the Red Cross is implementing it, but as they have that auxiliary role, they're always part of the national system. So it's not really an issue for us integrating them at the national level. Thank you very much, Ms. Forbes. Certainly partnerships bring us a lot of, a far away in the responding to the emergencies. And we heard that as one of the themes throughout our various um, panelists in, in their presentations. Uh, we will now take uh, our final question from Tisha Linton from the Regional Security System in the Caribbean. Hi, good afternoon, Mr. Glees. Good afternoon, everyone. First, I wanted to say thank you to all our presenters and panelists for such um, thought-provoking presentations and how we move forward after the events <laughs> that's going on within the region and the world. My question was actually going to go to um, Ms. Forbes and Ms. Freddie talking about the same um, integrating our international agencies within the region. However, I will now pose that question to Cynthia, noting that with the current increase and frequency in hydrometeorological hazards, and given the seismic um, activities that have been occurring in the region over the last couple of years, and unfortunately noting some of the resources that are lacking within the region, I um, wanted to know how the Cynthia C. FEMA integrating and offering support to the Caribbean. Thank you, 
Thank you for the question. I think it's so important to have um, those open dialogues. And it was one of the things that I was thinking about um, with Ms. Pierre's question too, in terms of being very transparent with each other about kind of what some of our planning factors are and what our actual capabilities are. And so having that kind of open and what are, what are opportunities, what are things that we might know are risks or capability gaps that we should be able to think about and talk to each other about uh, and plan for more broadly. Um, and there's certainly a lot of value in whether they're forums like this or we have the opportunity to share kind of lessons learned around that space um, and also provide some visibility into what are some of the unique uh, local things we can focus on and learn more about the communities so that it is, it is the best type of support that we can offer and learn from each other. Um, so that would be my answer to your question. Yeah, thank you very much, Ms. Bishak uh, from FEMA. Uh, thank you all, um, all the members uh, from our panelists, our main speaker, Ms. Elizabeth Riley, uh, Ms. Cynthia uh, Spishnak, Dr. Uh, Joy St. John, Ms. Claudia Herrera, and Ms. Michelle Forbes from the National Emergency Management Organization, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, that's all the time we have, ladies and gentlemen. It has been a very interesting session. Thank you all very much for sharing with us and do have a very good rest of the afternoon. Thank you all. Fantastic stuff coming out of these sessions. Definitely some common themes from yesterday into today. Words like inclusion, innovation, science, technology, data exchange, creativity, agility, adaptability, partnership, planning, and preparation are words that we constantly hear used in these sessions. I would like to take the opportunity to thank Horace Glaze, who was in charge of the special session. I saw him practicing his Spanish and his French. Buenas tardes, buen apremedi, sir. I'd also like to thank Alonzo Brenes and Zelmira May, who guided the uh, session on learning, the, the learning lab session. Um, we really want to also thank our participants who comment, they share, and they also pose their questions. Without their participation, then it really wouldn't be as dynamic as it has been. So we're bringing down the curtains on day two of RP21, and we just have a couple of reminders for you. Number one, we have virtual tour. There's a virtual tour that is sitting right now on the Hopping platform, and it's an ideas incubator. There are 29 new ideas on disaster risk reduction uh, that have been put forward, and so you have the ability to go, to click on, to visit, to look at this virtual tour, to explore and to learn and possibly come up with new ideas of your own. Not only is the virtual tour there, we also have official statements from member states, intergovernmental organizations, and other partner groups from which you may learn a thing or two. For the members of the media fraternity, I am reminding you that tomorrow is your very last time, your last chance to sign up and to register for the media training that has been taking place over the last two days, and it is specific just to our journalists with regards to covering news and how to use appropriate language when we're speaking about disasters. Again, we want to take the opportunity to, to acknowledge uh, our partners. Thank you so very much to the organizer, the government of Jamaica, specifically the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development, as well as co-organizers, SIDEMA, Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, as well as UNDRR, the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. We added a live Twitter feed right there, so uh, if you're using the Hopping platform and you're using the hashtags, hashtag RP21, hashtag resilient JA, hashtag resilient Caribbean, hashtag Sendai Americas, then we will see that live Twitter feed. Before we say goodbye, I would just like to say that in the special session that Horace Glaze was moderating, it was very nice to see a panelist and a speaker from SVG. 
I don't know if a lot of you are aware, but in, from last year into to this year, a lot of our dignitaries from SVG, panelists, speakers, and participants, they were not a part of a lot of our virtual uh, ecosystem or virtual events because of the disasters that they experienced. Not only did they have the eruption, but they had flooding right after, and then of course they had evacuation all while dealing with a pandemic. So when we look at the theme, building resilience, you know, it's really nice to see SVG participating, and I think they are uh, examples of what resilient people, especially in the Caribbean, look like. So on behalf of everyone here, I mean, we're coming to you live from the Jamaica Conference Center. Uh, we wish you all the best. Sleep tight for those who are already on their way, and for those of us who are here and on our way home, I wish you a very safe trip. We will see you tomorrow, same time, same place. We look forward to serving you. Take care.